Well, many of you will be familiar with the old masters of philosophical comedy, Monty Python. One of their most philosophical lines is that nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, uh, a, a line sadly debased by too many memes. Uh, but the truth is that uh, we all expect to suffer in theory, but very few of us really expect it. Today's sermon is not going to change that. Uh, my aim is a bit more modest. I want us to think about preparing for the suffering that we don't expect. And in case I run out of time, here are my two application points. Prepare to receive the honour of suffering for Christ and prepare the words that you will need when suffering comes. We can all go home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please um, water our hearts with your life-giving word and bring forth in them the fruits of faith and obedience for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we stood next to Jeremiah and we watched a master potter working to make the perfect pot. And he used flawed clay to do it. That flawed clay, of course, stood for Israel, chosen and saved by grace, but become irreversibly corrupt. And we saw that a deep wisdom of God was at work in Israel's failure because their destruction actually turned out to be the means by which God was always going to fulfill his original promise. Paul called the Israelites objects of God's wrath prepared for destruction. But lest we imagine that God uh, approached the destruction of his people with cold calculation, Jeremiah is shown a divine potter whose response to Israel's sin is marked by a deep, deep regret. God is not detached from those he judges. But the parable of the potter alone by itself can't really convey the way in which God involves himself with his people or what happens as a result. For that, we need to move from what God showed uh, Jeremiah and think about what God did to Jeremiah. So uh, we were in Jeremiah 18. Uh, in the last part of that chapter, we see Jeremiah's listeners expressing their hatred of God by attacking the messenger. And we hear Jeremiah crying out in pain and betrayal. I'm not going to look at that bit today. Uh, that's only one part part one of the story. In Jeremiah 19 and 20, the story of Jeremiah 18 gets repeated and amplified. First of all, in chapter 19, we get another symbolic action involving a pot, but this time the pot isn't made of soft clay that can be mushed up. It's brittle, fired clay, and it can't be refashioned anymore. Instead, Chapter 19, verse 10, God says to Jeremiah, break the jar while those who go with you are watching and say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Uh, this is a destruction from which it seems there is no coming back. And the listener's reaction against the messenger gets more severe as well. For the first time in the book, Jeremiah suffers actual physical abuse, chapter 20, verse 1. When the priest Pashur, son of Emer, the official in charge of the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. Now, not, not of course, that this manages to silence Jeremiah. Uh, God gives him a stinging rebuke for his persecutor in verse 3. The next day when Paschur released him for the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, the Lord's name for you is not Paschur, but terror on every side. For this is what the Lord says, I will make you a terror to yourself and all your friends. With your own eyes you will see them fall by the sword of their enemies. I will give all Judah into the hands of the king of Babylon. 
But here's the thing. Jeremiah has been promising this sort of judgment for years, and nothing has ever happened. A couple of chapters on, Jeremiah has this to say in uh, chapter 25. If I can find it, he says, um, For 23 years the word of the Lord has come to me, and I've spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. Maybe the first few times that Jeremiah prophesied judgment, his listeners felt a bit of fear. But you can bet that wore off many years ago. Just put yourself in Jeremiah's place for a minute. How long do you think it would take before you began to feel a sense of betrayal sneaking up on you? That God was maybe hanging you out to dry, making you suffer needlessly by this delay of judgment. For Jeremiah, that feeling of betrayal has been steadily growing ever since back in chapter 11 he found out to his surprise that his own family members were conspiring to get rid of him. And he's expressed his frustration and his anguish to God in a series of heartfelt prayers. Well, today what I want to focus on is the last of these prayers, the rest of chapter 20. And I want to think about how it completes the story of the potter and his plan. There are three parts to this prayer. There's a lament, there's a song of praise, and there's a curse. And Jeremiah's lament uh, takes aim in three directions. First at God, uh, then at himself, and then at his enemies. Uh, chapter 20, verse 7. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying perhaps he'll be deceived. Then we'll prevail over him and take our revenge on him. Many Christian readers have felt nervous about Jeremiah's accusation that God is deceitful in verse 7. <clears throat> but Jeremiah is not accusing God of lying here. Jeremiah knew from the start, because God tells him at his call in chapter 1, that he was going to experience strong hostility. But here's the thing, being told about it is one thing, actually experiencing it is quite another thing. Deceived me here basically means made a fool of me. You know, Jeremiah's thinking, God, you called me from birth. You singled me out with your special regard. You gave me this unique role. Sure, you said it would be tough, but you knew I wouldn't resist the honor of being your chosen instrument. And now, every extra day that your words remain unfulfilled, I look like a bigger idiot. And it's not as if they're easy words to speak either. The words that you put in my mouth, they're so full of violence and destruction that they come out of my mouth like these cries of pain and despair. It hurts to speak them. It hurts that everyone hates me for speaking them. And if I try to keep them in unspoken, they burn my insides until I can't bear to keep them in any longer. But that suffering that Jeremiah endures from having God's words inside him is only half the story. The other half is the suffering Jeremiah endures from being one of God's people himself. This is clearer in some of his earlier laments, but there's a clue to it in verse 10, where the people take Jeremiah's prophecy against the priest back in verse 3, and they mock him with it. They say, oh, Jeremiah, you prophesied terror on every side for our priest, did you? Well, he's doing okay, thanks. But look at you now, twisted in the stocks, 
surrounded by your enemies, just one slip of the tongue away from death. That future judgment that Judah was going to experience when Babylon surrounded the city on every side, that future judgment is being experienced right now by Jeremiah. Jeremiah, just like Judah, the flawed pot, Jeremiah was chosen to be broken. And because Jeremiah is also God's representative among the people, we see in Jeremiah that God chooses to be broken too. One of the precious gifts that Jeremiah gives us is a profound insight into the inner life of Jesus, the one whose ministry Jeremiah foreshadowed. I've got no doubt that Jeremiah helped Jesus to interpret and give voice to his incarnate experience just as Jeremiah helps us to, ex to appreciate the life of Jesus. Jeremiah shows us a Jesus who did not have to wait for Gethsemane before he started suffering mental and spiritual anguish, but he shows us a Jesus who lived his whole life caught between the pain of God's wrath and sorrow sitting in his bones and the pain of the nation's hostility giving him a foretaste of his death every day. Not a moment of our Lord's life was free from suffering. Now there are differences between Jesus and Jeremiah, of course, and I'll come to them in a minute. But first of all, let's look at the rest of Jeremiah's prayer from verse 11. 11 to 13. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. So Jeremiah is caught between a rock and a hard place and he chooses the rock. He remembers what God promised him at the beginning. They will fight against you, God said at the start, but they will not overcome you for I will deliver you from the grasp of the cruel. And so Jeremiah takes hold of that promise and he gets strength to pray for justice. Verse 12 uses language from the law courts to ask that the revenge that the people were hoping for in verse 10 would be paid back to them in the form of God's vengeance. Right? Jeremiah is asking that God would make his character visible in what happens to Jeremiah and in what happens to the people. And then, having claimed God's promise by praying for justice, Jeremiah's spirits soar into praise as he remembers who God is, a rescuer at heart. It's a beautiful progression from bitter anguish and suffering to the memory of God's promise and from there to the praise of God's goodness. It'd be nice if it ended there, wouldn't it? But Jeremiah is not done. He gets that Judah has to be destroyed from his excursion to the potter's workshop. He gets that. He gets that Judah's destruction is going to bring something greater into being. He even gets that his part in it is going to be to suffer as one of the people and to be vindicated as a sign of things to come. But he does not get why it had to be him. And so he calls down a fourfold curse upon himself. Verse 14, cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, a child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon. For he did not kill me in the womb, with my mother as my grave, her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? Jeremiah's four wishes get progressively more violent and confronting. 
this first wish is that a day would be cursed, the day that his mother gave birth. His second wish is that a person would be cursed, the person who gladdened his father. His third wish makes cities represent that person, cities mercilessly overthrown. And his fourth wish in the second half of that verse um, makes this person like a wailing citizen of a city about to die. Why such a terrible fate for that person? Verse 7, Jeremiah resents him for not making his mother's womb into his tomb. And there's actually a terrible logic to that wish, if you think about it. You know, God filled Jeremiah with words that have made his life a misery. And he gave Jeremiah no say in the matter. Back in chapter 1, Jeremiah, uh, God said to Jeremiah, before you were born, I set you apart as a prophet in the womb. And so here's Jeremiah imagining himself in his mother's womb, already filled with words of suffering and death. It's like his mother is pregnant with battle cries and terror. And in the painful logic of Jeremiah's curse, he feels it would have been less painful for his mother to perpetually keep him from coming out than it was for him to keep God's fiery words from coming out. The price that God made Jeremiah pay when he set him apart from his birth, that price was so high that there would be less net suffering for his mother to stay nine months pregnant and laboring fruitlessly forever. What is maybe most remarkable of all is that Jeremiah's self-curse doesn't cancel out the earlier parts of his prayer. He bitterly resents that it had to be him but he still recognizes the value of his suffering. He can even praise God for what God achieves through him. But at the end, Jeremiah is left alone in the dark. That final cry in verse 18, why me, takes us straight to Gethsemane, where Jesus also is left in the dark after he prays that similarly contradictory prayers. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. There's such a deep significance to this complex prayer of Jeremiah. It's the book of Jeremiah begins by identifying all of Jeremiah's words with the word of the Lord. And that means that even these words of bitter complaint have been sort of co-opted by God as God's own words. In other words, Jeremiah's pain and suffering isn't just here in the book to make us feel sorry for him. But it's here in the book to reveal God's character to us, to reveal the manner in which God makes himself present among us as judge. And it's not just the words of Jeremiah that make God present among Israel. It is the pain of that message as it burns within him. It's the pain as it comes out of his mouth with an agony like childbirth. It's the pain of the people's hatred. It's the pain of so much wasted life. God is present among his people as judge in all this pain. Jeremiah takes us so deep into the identity of our Lord Jesus but he doesn't take us all the way in. Unlike Jeremiah, nobody made a fool out of Jesus. The day of his birth wasn't foisted upon him. It was freely chosen so that he had no reason to curse it. Don't forget that the God who atones is not just the Father who sends, but also the Son who comes because he loves the Father. Unlike Jeremiah, Jesus took up his calling with his eyes wide open. And unlike Jeremiah, Jesus was not spared from death. The terrors that surrounded Jeremiah destroyed Jesus as he was shattered 
by a God into whose face he looked trustingly the whole time. Of course, God's promise to Jeremiah of eventual rescue didn't fail Jesus, but neither did it spare him from death. The first readers of this book of Jeremiah lived in uh, the spiritual death of Babylonian exile. And I think Jeremiah's experience was an assurance to them that there was a future on the other side of death. And it's the same for us. So I want to spend uh, just a very brief time reflecting on what this might look like through those two pieces of advice. Number one, prepare to receive the honour of suffering for Christ. Now, first of all, we need to separate, of course, the unique aspects of Jeremiah's experience out of the equation when we apply it to us. We're not called to be prophets like Jeremiah was. Jeremiah's role was completed by the apostles whose words sit alongside the prophets to make up scripture. Now, when Paul says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, he's interpreting his apostolic calling in Jeremiah-like categories. Christians today are not called and compelled in the way that Jeremiah and Paul were. And yet... When Paul presents the ministry he shares with his co-workers, he uses very similar language, less exclusively. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. We may not be prophets or apostles, but we are called to imitate Paul's imitation of Christ. What does that look like? Well, it looks like knowing that because we have the prophetic word of the gospel, when we speak that word, we will suffer. Prepare to suffer. Like Paul said of his gospel ministry, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. Like Jeremiah, like Paul, we are fragile pots, not because we are hostile to God, but because as Christ's witnesses, we suffer from the hostility of others towards Jesus. And we've got perishable bodies. Until God clothes us with Christ's imperishable life, the world is going to see Christ's glory through our weakness, provided that we keep our eyes fixed on him as we suffer. So when you prepare for future ministry, Make sure that along with everything else you prepare for, you prepare for suffering. Think about what that might look like and how you might respond. Secondly, prepare the words that you will need when suffering comes. Jeremiah complained that God made a fool of him by delaying his judgment. But what really pushed him into despair was that he didn't see his persecution coming. It was like the Spanish Inquisition. Right? He is sure he expected it is in theory as we all do. We know that the message of the cross is going to attract hostility and yet we never really expect to suffer. I'm really interested by how conscious the reformers were of this, whose lives were so full of suffering. Our deceitful hearts make fools out of us, basically. So here's the thing. When you are, find yourself blindsided by a hostility that just comes at you out of nowhere and crushes your spirit and maybe worse, what are you going to say? Are you going to imitate Jeremiah and call down God's vengeance upon your oppressors because you recognize that their hatred of you is just an expression of their hatred for God? Are those the prayers you should be preparing well, once again, of course, we can only answer that question through its fulfillment in Jesus. Remember that Jesus prayed both types of prayer. Father, forgive them. But the man who prayed that also prayed and recognized that God would judge his enemies. As he said to the Pharisees, anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and crushed. The difference between us and Jesus is that we're not prophets we don't know god's plans for our enemies and so we've got to pray both prayers at once right? we need to pray that people who stand against us and bring us painfully down might repent and become god's friends 
But at the same time, we pray in confidence that God's judgment on the enemies of Christ, whoever they may be, would be fulfilled. That's the meaning of the prayer, your kingdom come. That praying of two opposite things at the same time reflects the internal tensions and struggles of people who suffer for the name of Christ. We share in Christ's sufferings, we rejoice in the knowledge of the glory to follow, and yet, just the sheer wrongness of things when evil triumphs and God is mocked can make life unbearable. God's word seems futile, his work feels unjust, and then like Jeremiah, we say in our heart, I wish I'd never been born. Martin Luther said that all the godly have felt this mood together with Christ who cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sometimes words like that need to be spoken, but they don't cancel out the affirmation that God rescues the life of the needy. Probably among the most painful sufferings that Christians endure are the ones that come from others within the church, from people without the experience of ignorance. How could Jeremiah be confident that he was in the right and Judah's leaders were in the wrong? They appealed to the scriptures as well. And so perhaps finally, like Jeremiah, we need to make sure that our first prayer in suffering is that God would examine our hearts and make them like Christ's, just as Christ looked to God in suffering, as it says in Hebrews, uh, offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who can save him from death. So we, by our humble, desperate reliance on God, can manifest Christ's nature among those who are hostile to him so that God in his freedom can save those whom he has always planned to save. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are sovereign over everything that has ever happened or ever will happen. And we pray that when we are struck unexpectedly and terribly by suffering that we don't observe, deserve that is just evil and unexplainable, that you would help us to pour out our pain to you in full honesty and yet not to let go of our confidence in your goodness and power. Make us like Jesus in our suffering, that like Jesus we may one day See glory and joy for Jesus' sake. Amen.